Welcome everyone to the Sano Genetics Podcast. I'm Patrick, the co-founder and CEO of Sano, and our guest today on the podcast is Joe Pickrell. He is the CEO and co-founder of GenCove, which is based in New York City, and they're pioneering something called low-pass genome sequencing, which we're going to talk about in a little bit more detail later. Before this, Joe was a professor at the New York Genome Center, working on statistical genetics. It's really great to have you on the podcast, Joe. Yeah, thanks, thanks a lot for having me. Great. Um, so before we talk about GenCove and low-pass sequencing, what that all is, it'd be great to just hear how you got into population genetics and statistical genetics in the first place. Yeah, so my background is I'm a, I'm a statistical geneticist. I was doing my PhD at uh, University of Chicago um, and ended up working with a, with a guy named Jonathan Pritchard, who, uh, who's well-known in the statistical genetics, population genetics literature uh, for having written programs like Structure. Um, and so basically what we were working on there was uh, the approach was just gather all the new interesting data sets, uh, sit down and think about them a little bit and, and say, what, what are the new questions or the longstanding questions? What are the new answers that we can come up with with, uh, uh, with uh, new data? Um, and, uh, and so that involved new statistical methods, just uh, new data analytics approaches. Um, and so I just kind of fell in love with that, that approach of uh, uh, taking large amounts of data and, and uh, trying to point it at really interesting uh, problems. Right. And what were some of the problems that were interesting when you were when you were doing your PhD, or I guess when you after that you went on to start your own group? What were some of the things you were interested in? Yeah. So early on, it was things like adaptation. So how do we how have humans evolved to adapt to different parts of the world? And so we did a lot a lot of work on um, understanding uh, the genes that are involved in adaptation to different different environments in Europe or in East Asia or, or in Africa. Um, and that and then we became interested in you know, sort of totally different, but like similar in the sense of their statistical problems of understanding how genetic variants influence uh, uh, gene expression. And so in turn, phenotypes. And so how do we start building up these, uh, the understanding of the, at a molecular level of how, how does a genetic variant influence the expression of a gene that then influences uh, your risk of heart disease or Alzheimer's disease or something like that. And so can we use genetics as sort of like the anchor to put together these, these types of networks? Um, and so very different problems, but all sort of unified by these, this is the new type of data that we can generate and how can we point uh, statistical tools uh, at, at these data. Right. And how, how have you seen that change over the last uh, decade or so in terms of the size of the research studies or, or the, even the questions you're trying to answer? Yeah, more data, uh, for sure. The questions surprisingly change a lot more slowly than the, than the data. Uh, and so we were, we were working on things like uh, in lymphoblastoid cell lines, the HapMap cell lines, we had something like uh, 100, 100 or something like that, um, some number of uh, LCLs. And we were looking at questions like, what is the contribution of uh, genetic variants in cysts? So genetic variants near a gene versus far from a gene. Uh, how do genetic variants that are far from a gene contribute to the expression of a gene? How do genetic variants that are near to a gene influence the expression of the gene? And that problem sort of it still exists. Right. Uh, 10 years later, sort of quantifying the, these sort of differences. Um, uh, but now there's just hundreds or thousands of times. Uh, right. And back then it was these lymphoblastoid cell lines, which are kind of an, an artificial system, <laughs> right? So you take uh, cells from a couple hundred people, transform them to be basically immortal, right? But now now they're doing the GTEC study, for example, is doing <laughs> what you described in Every, well, not every, but the, most of the yeah, tissue. All the tissue you can get your hands on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think what's been really interesting in that is like we started and everybody started with this idea of like, all right, we'll map the EQTLs. If we map the EQTLs, then we'll understand how diseases work um, and that the genetic variants that influence disease, they'll all be EQTLs and it'll be sort of obvious that if you have Alzheimer's, you have an EQTL in uh, maybe it's an inflammatory disease. And so you have a, a, a EQTL in monocytes and that's what's causing Alzheimer's and so you take the Alzheimer's GWAS, you take the EQTL GWAS, you overlap them, boom, biology is solved and, and it really didn't turn out that way at all and like I, I'd argue that even like it's it's kind of unclear to me that the EQT, EQTL studies that we've done in the last 10 years have really informed biology and any like the biology of disease in any sort of real like transformative way. It's been yeah. a, a lot of money and a lot of research and a lot of like interesting stuff but like of the ultimate goal of can we now use this to fundamentally, has this fundamentally changed how we understand disease? Eh, not really. Right. 
For for people who are coming at this from um, less of a scientific background and more of a interest in personal genomics, would you mind just explaining? Because I think it's really important what an EQTL is and mm -hmm. and this thought process of genetic variant to change in a gene to to then some change on the on the level of the organism. Yeah. So if you if you look at, at the level of an organism, we can identify genetic variants that influence traits. And so I and many other people have sort of tried to quantify. Uh, of the genetic variants that influence traits, how many of them actually change a protein sequence? Like the actual, you know, the structure of your hair or the structure of your blood cells or the, the actual, like the physical protein physical thing. Sequence. Yeah. Um, and how many of them uh, don't? And so what, 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 what ends up being the case is the vast majority of them uh, don't. They, they don't influence the actual protein sequences. They do something else. You can see like there's, there's something over here that's very clearly associated with the disease but it's not near any gene, or maybe it's near some genes, but it's not in any of the genes. And so the, the hypothesis, which makes sense, is that, oh, it must influence like the amount of the gene, the timing of when it's turned on and all of these types of things. Uh, and so that um, uh, uh, understanding the genetics of uh, how genes are expressed is called uh, expression quantitative trait locus mapping, EQTL mapping. So you find uh, genetic variants that influence these sort of lower level phenotypes of like, is this gene turned on in the brain? At, how, at what level is it turned on in the brain? Is it turned on in the blood? At what level is it turned on in the blood? And you can find genetic variants then influence uh, and influence that. And so the the idea was and still is, I think that not by pushing down to this type of level of like really you know, understanding how genetic variants influence the actual expression of genes, not necessarily their sequence, you'd get a, a deeper understanding into these, these higher level phenotypes like diseases. Um, right. So the Alzheimer's example you gave, maybe there's something in the immune system. That's the current understanding, right? There's something is a little bit um, different or, or off in the immune system that causes buildup of plaques. But I think even on, on such a simple case, we're, we're still very far from understanding oh, yeah. no. how yeah. genetics makes it all the way to, mm -hmm. um, to, to something that complex things like apoe which is like the major huge uh, determinant of uh, of alzheimer's disease risk like how does it actually work I don't think we have great news i i seem to remember it was probably maybe a year and a half or two years ago you were part of a research paper that looked at um selection in modern humans mm -hmm. is that right so and i, I think this is a, a quite a fascinating concept and it's re, and it's related to this conversation about alzheimer's but you all were able to find evidence that actually in the last even in the last hundred years or so you can detect that humanity is uh, is undergoing some genetic changes when most of the things we study are thousands or tens of thousands of years old right like if you think about adaptation to people living in 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 climate in different climates or or altitude or lactose tolerance is the classic one can can you give a just a quick overview of this because i remember reading it and thinking how fascinating it was yeah so this is one of these where again it's the take uh, new data and apply to old questions there is this uh, idea of a uh, um, we actually learned about this after the fact, but it, but it was interesting, was this idea from Richard Lewinton, sort of a famous evolutionary biologist uh, from Harvard in the 60s or something. Still around, sorry. But like, uh, you know, that, that's when he was in his heyday. Um, and, uh, uh, and he, he sort of gave this presentation trying to say, when, how, do we, how could we really understand uh, the genetics of, of adaptation? And how do we understand, like adaptation again is, is, is basically just the changes adaptive changes in, in, in allele frequency over time, dire directionally biased changes in allele frequency over time due to some uh, uh, pressure. Um, and he proposed this crazy idea, which is what you should do is get like hundreds of thousands of people and sequence them um, and follow them through their lifetime and just watch as they drop off. Is it, is it you know, people, people die over time? Is it, are you more likely to die if you have this genetic variant at age 20 and, and not this other genetic variant, but what about at age 60? Are you more likely to die if you have this genetic variant and this other genetic variant? And now uh, with <clears throat> resources like the UK Biobank, um, and we used a, a, a Kaiser Permanente, which is a, a health system. Right. Healthcare system, system, right, yeah. Um, has, has made a bunch of data available for research. You can start to actually do exactly that. The sort of crazy idea is no longer totally crazy. Uh, and so what we did was just take people, partition them by time, this was in collaboration with Molly Shavorsky at, at Columbia, um, partition them based on how old they were and just look and see if there were changes in allele frequency uh, over time, which would be this uh, 
indication first of mortality. So people are dying at different rates depending on their genotype, uh, but it has implications about, about natural selection, that these things are, 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 have been shifting over likely over, over a couple generations. Right. Yeah. Fascinating. And, and so I guess while you were, you were at the New York Genome Center working on some of these problems and that led you to, to start looking actually at different kinds of sequencing technology, which, which led you to found GenCove. So can you tell us about that part of your career and, and what got you into looking at polygenic risk scores or some of these um, kind of new methods for going from the single location to predicting the impact on a gene to, to slightly more um, methods that involve huge amounts of data and, and every position or many millions or thousands of positions in the DNA. Yeah. So what, what we were doing at the New York Genome Center is we had the access to the latest and greatest sequencing technologies. I think we bought the Illumina X10 and some of these, uh, some of these big sequencing machines, uh, these massive throughput. But <clears throat> even though the massive throughput, you think about a like the X10 system, when it came online, uh, <clears throat> they were billing it as we can do 18,000 genomes in a year. Uh, but when we think, as a, from a statistical genetics point of view, you know, 18,000 genomes in a year is great, but it, you know, you need millions. You want 10 times that, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. And so how can you take this amazing uh, hardware and this amazing um, sequencing capacity and turn it into something that's very sort of low cost, because you, if you're gonna be sequencing millions of people, you, can't cost a thousand dollars each each time you do it. How do you take something, make it very low cost and high throughput, so you could be doing millions of genomes a year at you know aspirationally ten dollars a genome. Um, right. And so, uh, what 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 we worked on, we saw, we saw some ideas in the literature and worked on our own things, which was basically uh, do less sequencing. The, the simple answer is just do much less sequencing per sample. Um, and then offload all the work to computation. And so we developed some new genotype imputation algorithms, uh, data uh, sequence data analysis algorithms that let us dramatically reduce the amount of sequencing done per sample. So our most popular product at, at GenCove is the 0.4x coverage uh, uh, genome, which is, so about 40% of the genome gets one sequencing read. Uh, and then uh, you can take that using imputation and some of the, these big databases that exist uh, out, of, out, in, out in the public domain uh, and fill in everything that you missed and you get a, basically a complete genome for, for you know, orders of magnitude less expensive. Right. So, so just for comparison, if, it, if you're talking about the $1,000 genome, it's, it's probably, right. depending on where you are, a little bit less than that now, but still... Eight, eight or nine hundred dollars, then that's typically 30x sequencing, right? So you're going to sequence every position uh, redundantly. So you'll know for sure we've got a T here because I've sequenced a T 30 times. But the method you use, actually, um, you don't even sequence every base, right? But then you have some, some clever um, algorithms that allow you to basically borrow information from other sequences to fill in the blanks, right? Mm -hmm. Yep, yep, fill in those blanks, and that means you can reduce, so our sort of list price for a 0.4x genome is around $50. So now you're right. in the price range where you can uh, uh, where you can start to think about doing this at a real scale. And the other advantage, of course, is that instead of doing one at a time, you're doing hundreds or thousands at a time, and so you can churn through these sequences extremely quickly. So how does this compare to, um, to a genotype array, which companies like 23andMe or Ancestry, so, so most people that... Um, I think actually a lot of people don't quite realize the difference in the types of technology used. So maybe it's worth just going through what what these direct consumer companies use and and why they're typically a hundred dollars or one hundred fifty dollars, and maybe how what what you're doing compares to that. Yeah, yeah, no, exactly. And so <clears throat> a thousand dollar genome uh, isn't compatible with the the types of price points that the direct consumer uh, companies need to hit in order to to get to get adoption. And so what everyone uses, is uh, an older technology called the genotyping array. Where instead of looking, instead of, you, you don't look at the whole genome. You look at um, a well-chosen, hopefully, uh, set of uh, hundreds of thousands of particularly chosen sites that you knew about ahead of time. <clears throat> and so you can put put these on a put these on a genotyping array. You hybridize the, the DNA to that, and some of them light up or, or not, depending on the genetic variant that's uh, that's there. Um, and so you, with a technology like this. Uh, you can you can measure instead of measuring 3.3 billion bases of somebody's genome, you can measure 100,000 sites, several hundred thousand sites, uh, 
with, uh, with, with great accuracy. Um, and that lets you get down <clears throat> to these types of price points that, uh, 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 that, make it, that make it compelling for something like a consumer genetics company. Um, and so what we do with sequencing at Genco, with low pass sequencing, is we get to those types of price points, uh, but with hundreds of type, times more data. Um, and so it depends on the application, the real advantage. If you're doing like a genome-wide association study, this amount of data increases your power to identify genetic associations. Um, if you're doing a polygenic risk scores, the, the increased imputation accuracy allows you to more accurately measure a polygenic risk score. These are the types of advantages of moving to a sequencing-based technology over, over genotyping technology. Yeah, so th there struck me as as a couple of really interesting potential advantages to this. My my understanding is the genotyping arrays, because like you've said, you've you've picked, you've pre-selected things that you know about. Um, almost by design, you're you're missing rare things that that you didn't know about. So if you if you have a genetic variant that's arisen in the past couple of generations, then it's probably not going to be captured by one of those chips. So, so does the low pass sequencing method allow you to, to pick up some of these things basically that you might've missed otherwise? Yeah, exactly. So especially once you start to get to some sort of scale, if you're, um, uh, we, we've done these back of the envelope or sometimes actually, uh, actual studies of identifying new de novo ident identification of genetic variation, uh, from low pass sequencing. And the, the back of the envelope is if it's present in about 10 copies, if a genetic variant is present in about 10 copies in the sample uh, and you've run low pass sequencing, uh, then you can probably detect it. Um, right. And that's uh, 10 copies in 100 people is in very low frequency, but 10 copies in 100,000 people is extremely low frequency. And so if a company like Ancestry or 23andMe had started like this, then they'd be, uh, there are mil many millions of samples, they'd be pushing down to very rare variants and now being able to impute those and, and call those. Right. So you, I'm guessing, then can offer this out to lots of different people. But um, because you're doing all the sequencing and analysis in one place, everybody can benefit from that um, pooled base of knowledge. Right. So you can actually start to um, mm -hmm. impute or guess these rare variants uh, much better than anyone could do on their own. Is yeah. that is that right? That makes sense. And do you have a, do you have interest from some of these companies to to start working with you guys? I think the, a lot of what, uh, if, you, if you go and talk to, so we, we actually launched with a, we had a direct-to-consumer type, type product. Um, and uh, if, you, if you ask people what they're, what they're really interested in, like the, the real driver of a lot of, um, a lot of adoption in direct-to-consumer genetics is things like uh, genealogy. Um, like pro actually, not a lot of the adoption. I think the main driver, I would say, of the adoption of, of direct-to-consumer genetics is, is genealogy. And That's why ancestry is, DNA is the biggest, right? And uh, not not any of the others. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and so, if you look at just from a pure, like, is there something that you can do better with low pass sequencing than genotyping arrays from perspective of genealogy? You know, they're probably fine. Right. Like, uh, and, and so, I think that's uh, it, it's a there's there's an important uh, choice in any company, which is choose the right technology for what you actually need to do. And if your right. goal is to do genealogy. Like you're, you're you're fine with the genotyping array. Right? I don't think there's any particular advantage of, of one uh, technology versus another. But um, you mentioned um, you mentioned polygenic risk scores earlier, which um, mm -hmm. which it seems to me like there there may be a, there's going to be huge demand from the healthcare system, if not um, well, we hope, I guess, if not from consumers. Would you mind explaining what a little more detail what that is? And yeah, how so polygenic risk score is so if you're trying to predict somebody's disease uh, risk of disease. Um, what we've learned over the past 10, 15, 20 years for, from human genetics is that uh, uh, there's not a single variant that's going to predict your risk of disease. Maybe there's, a, in the case like Alzheimer's, there's APOE, which is a single genetic variant that predicts your risk of disease. Uh, but overall, if you want to do the best at predicting you know, disease in hundreds of thousands or millions of people, uh, disease risk is influenced by many thousands or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of genetic variants that, uh, that you carry or don't carry. Um, and so in order to make a more accurate disease risk prediction, you need to actually measure all tens or hundreds of thousands of those genetic variants and sum them up into a score. All of them are fairly small effects. So it's sort of saying you have a thousand genetic variants that increase risk of disease and 200 that decrease risk of disease. So you're at increased risk of disease. Right. Uh, and so they all sort of act in these, in these very small effect type models. Uh, but there are many hundreds of thousands of them, uh, which means they add up to something substantial. Um, 
And so what, what you can now do with these things like polygenic risk scores is measure all of these genetic variants, add them up into this score, and start partitioning people into to categories of disease risk. Um, so uh, you, you've probably seen the, the, the great papers by, uh, let's say, uh, Katherson and colleagues, where it's saying the people out in the tails, the people with the, for whatever reason, unluckily ended up with many more disease risk increasing alleles than disease risk decreasing alleles, they end up uh, uh, with much higher risk of, of disease, and cardiovascular disease, breast cancer, uh, a number of other diseases. Yeah, th th there seems to be a, quite a bit of debate as to whether these scores are, whether and how much utility they're going to add in the healthcare system. I, based on my understanding of it, it, it seems to me like they're going to be a very powerful tool. They may not, um, they may not be life changing for everyone, but for two or three percent of people who do fall into this category, uh, they're often, if you take uh, cardiovascular disease for example, they're often not. Um, obviously affected by any of the other major risk factors. In some cases, they don't have high cholesterol. They don't necessarily have, um, they're not smoking. They may even be active, but, uh, but like you said, there's a, there's a genetic roll of the dice or a bad flip of the coin. That means they've ended up with a really high number of these risk variants compared to non-risk. Yeah, no, totally agree with that. Like, I think a lot of this debate will sort of be, um, be resolved just by rolling this stuff out and there, there will be these clinical trials. I know they're underway. Right. Um, and so just assembling the level of evidence to convince everyone is very different than sort of the level of evidence of a few people, early adopters and people who sort of like try to see where the technology will be in a few years. Um, and so, you know, the medical establishment is fairly conservative in a lot of ways. Huh. Um, and so that, you know, because people are always trying to sell them a bill of goods that this, we have this latest technology that'll change your life and this one will change your life and that one will change your life. But, yeah. Ultimately, in the end, you know, only a handful of things really catch on. I think polygenic right. scores will, will end up being very useful. One of the other issues that people often bring up with them is that they don't translate as well across um, different people with different ethnic backgrounds. Is that something that you all have have looked at or worked on? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we've looked at it a bit. It's really a, it's a it's a data problem of getting uh, getting these. I mean, a lot of this is driven by, frankly, the UK biobank, like the f half a million people with electronic medical records and genetic data. It's like the perfect data set to train these types of models uh, and evaluate them. Um, it's in the UK. Uh, and so bias towards uh, the UK uh, populations. I think there would be a ton of these resources uh, coming online in, in different countries over the next few, five years even. Some of them are even out now. Seems like every month a new, there's a new national genome project being announced. Yeah, yeah. and so as these, these types of things come online, a lot of the uh, the issues about everything being biased towards the UK biobank, just because it's in the, the UK, uh, will start to be resolved. Right, and 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 is the root of the problem? Is it one of these issues of the of bias in the genotype chips, or is it is it just that there's not enough data of each? What's so so? Could it you know? Is it that yeah. the chips were designed based on people of of British ancestry or or European ancestry? And then they're being applied elsewhere. Is it possible that an unbiased method like sequencing mm -hmm. can help? And in, I'm not actually. Sh I'm sure people are out there working on these kind of things, but I don't know the answer. Yeah, I, th I think it, so. It's both. I think it, there's a contribution of just um, not measuring enough people of a, of a given ancestry. And then there's a problem of the actual technology used to to make that measurement. And there's there's no doubt that you know you take the the cheapest genotyping arrays, things like the Illumina GSA. They're, they're not, they don't perform well in African populations, for example. It's just there's, there's not enough sites on the chip to cover the diversity of, of African populations. It just does, doesn't, the math doesn't add up. Um, and so moving to a sequencing-based technology would undoubtedly help. Like the actual, how much would it help versus just doing it in a large, like running the, a chip in a large number of, of people? Uh, I don't know the exact number, but both probably uh, certainly yeah. contribute. Are, are the chips getting cheaper as quickly as sequencing is getting cheaper? Are the chips going to be, you know, three dollars in ten years? That like the sequencing is going to be a hundred or or fifty, or is it, um, or are they changing at different rates? Uh, they are. The chips are getting cheaper, definitely, um, especially as um, as different companies have sort of scaled up. They uh, the, you get to these sorts of economies of scale where you're generating. You know, millions and millions of genotyping uh, arrays. You, you get a lot of efficiency that way. 
Um, and so they are getting cheaper. I think it, it's kind of inevitable that the sequencing, the sequencing prices are dropping much faster. Right. So it's it's probably the, the uh, if not already, it's the analysis part that costs more, or uh, maybe even the shipping. Right. If you're doing saliva yeah. kits, then yeah. Oh yeah, or the saliva kit itself. <laughs> right. Or the yeah, the saliva kit itself. <laughs> Those are five or five or ten pounds, aren't they? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, I know we've been talking a lot about humans, but I know that you all, and and actually I think pretty much everyone we've had on this podcast has been talking about humans. So I want to um, just zoom out a little bit because I know what you're doing can be applied not just to humans, but um, mm -hmm. to basically anything that uh, that lives, breathes, reproduces. Would you be able to tell us about some of the interesting research you're working on there? Yeah, yeah. So there's there's a lot of really interesting stuff in. So we we do now do a lot of work in in agriculture. Um, and so genetics, um, I mean, a lot of the, the great quantitative geneticists and great population geneticists worked at work in agriculture on, you know, R.A. Fisher analyzing corn plots and, and things, like right. things along those lines. Um, but uh, uh, nowadays, there's a ton of uh, genomics work in agriculture. I'm not sure the total number of genotyping arrays may be higher in cattle than it is in, in humans per year. That's right. Yeah. Um, and, the, and the, the way this is being used, it's used to direct breeding. Um, and so there's a long history of, you know, being able, analogously to how we want to predict uh, risk of disease in a person, you want to predict the milk output of a, of a cow, or you want to predict uh, exactly how marbled the steak will be if it want, once you right. uh, make a steak. Um, and so you have these giant pedigrees of, of how animals are related. Um, and so for, for 30 years or so, those, those that type of information has been used to help predict uh, which animal should breed with which, which one has a higher genetic propensity to make more milk or, or uh, um, reproduce faster or whatever sort of traits you need. Uh, and now genetic information uh, adds a whole new level on top of that. So you, you can start to uh, actually produce the in, analogously to the polygenic risk scores because a lot of the case, and a lot of times there's no, there's not one genetic variant that is sort of milk production, right. um, production variant. It's the effect of the entire genome. So now using an approach analogous to, to polygenic risk scores, you can predict the, the, uh, the bulls and the cows that are, that are that made together to have the, have the most milk. Um, and so that's sort of done routinely in, in, in agriculture and cattle and pigs and chickens and uh, more in, in uh, as, as the costs have dropped in plant species as well, um, in maize and soybeans. Uh, and so we're doing more and more in, in that space. So the same type of approach where you build out these big haplotype reference panels, like in humans, like you have the 1000 Genomes panel, uh, you can generate those now at a relatively low cost uh, and start doing low pass sequencing um, in, in all of these different species as well. And some of these species, they, they have no genotyping array. So it's not that uh, you're, yeah, there's no, no other option. You no other option. Have cost high throughput um, technology uh, sequencing is the only way to go. In in agriculture, do you need more or fewer um, uh, call them participants in a study? Is it is it fewer because they're they've been bred that the genetics are often simpler, or or is it um, or am I getting that backwards? Yeah, yeah, no, they're definitely. So I guess they're they're the genetic architectures or the actual genetic variants that influence the trait. I'm not sure if that's simpler or not, but. Uh, imputation is certainly easier right. um, because they've, they've been inbred for, for years, um, generations. Um, and so the extent of LD is generally larger. Um, and so low pass sequencing often works even better in, in a lot of the agricultural right. species. I mean, yes, because my understanding from some of the, there are a number of these pet direct to consumer companies where you can get them to tell you what species your um your dog is and my understanding was that that's probably in some in many cases more reliable than um than the human estimates because human history is so complicated and we're constantly mixing and migrating and and to say your great grandparents are uh you know from a particular region of the world can mean something really differently but for um for animal breeds it's uh it's a little bit different right because they've been as mm -hmm. you say, bred together and, and things are a little mm -hmm. bit more simple. Yep, yep. And so we work with uh, with uh, Darwin's Dogs, which is a project out of Eleanor Carlson's lab at, uh, at the Broad. 
Um, and we do uh, we do all the sequencing for them and, and analytics. And so they're using low pass sequencing in dogs. And you can definitely tell that you know the dog breeds. You know they've been bred to be breeds. Um, and so unlike humans, which are outbred populations, uh, dog breeds are, are breeds. And so they're uh, much less homozygous, much more inbred. So just looking towards the future a little bit, not not just for you, uh, for you and what you'll be doing, but in general, do you which do you, do you think will be how soon do you think we'll be sequencing everybody at birth, say, and as part of a healthcare system, um, or do you, or do you see this playing out some way? And, and then what's next after that? Are we going to then start sequencing RNA um, from every tissue constantly, or where do you you know where do you see this next uh, after that? Yeah, no, it's it's actually kind of hard to predict because people have been saying this for a decade now that well everyone will be sequenced at birth and as part of a health system. I don't think it's really happened. And I actually don't even think it's that close. Uh, if you look at what's really been adopted in terms of genomics, it's things like non-invasive prenatal testing, carrier screening, uh, particularly like oncology tests, so BRCA testing um, and things like that. And so I think a lot of this will get uh, adopted through through those different types of um, specialties. Um, there's no, we haven't seen at least any demand from like a GP saying like someone's coming into my clinic today, I need their genome for some reason. Right. Um, they, they have a ton of other information that they're trying to sort through anyways. Uh, but in particular specialties, um, again, genomic information adds a ton. Um, and I think what we'll see is that the, that number of specialties where genomic information adds a ton will continue and continue to grow until eventually there are these sort of progressive uh, uh, healthcare systems that just say, we're not going to have a cardiology test and a Right. Uh, and a cancer test and a prenatal screening test and this test was just as soon as somebody walks in the door, we'll just get that data from them to start and, and disperse it as, as necessary. Um, but that's sort of a, it's more of a, uh, a business or market question and, right. uh, and a scientific question. I mean, it well, makes sense that this should travel with you. Yeah. And I, and I also think in some case it's a, it's a, how the data travels question because here in the UK, the, we think of the NHS as one monolithic system, but if you just because you've been sequenced for one particular reason does, you know, if you've, let's say your child has a rare condition and you get sequenced as part of the 100,000 Genomes Project, it's not as though that data is going to be used to, to do cardiovascular disease prediction by someone else elsewhere in the system. So there's the, the question I always wrestle with is, like you said, will there some point be a healthcare system that says we've done the math and it makes sense to sequence everybody, mm -hmm. or will they figure out ways to say we're only going to we're going to sequence people as soon as it's necessary and relevant? For example, in breast cancer screening, but we're going to be flexible in terms of IT and allow this data to be used across mm -hmm. the system. And mm -hmm. I don't know which one will come first. Yep. Yeah. No, it's it's a, it's really tough. Uh, and in in the U.S., it's every healthcare system, there's, everything's fragmented. And so different different places operate in different ways. You have Kaiser that's sort of integrated. You have these these other sorts of health systems where they're just clinics associated with the hospital. It's, it's all, uh, I mean, yeah, it's more of a infrastructure and uh, who's incentives, who's actually interested in getting this information at what time and, and how can you, right. how you structure that? There's, and there are lots in the US, there are lots of different experiments being run, which is one of the nice things about that fragmented system. You've got Kaiser Permanente doing one thing. And I just read the other day that a um, big Intermountain Health, big healthcare system in Utah is going to sequence half a million people, something yep. like that. So, yep. yeah. So I guess, I guess we'll see. We can check yeah, back. There are all these experiments going on. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, great. I don't want to take too much of your time. Um, if people want to keep in touch with your work, uh, either you or company, is there? Can you let us know what your website is, your Twitter, that sort of thing? Yeah, sure. So Gencove is gencove.com, G-N-C-O-V-E.com, and uh, Twitter, I'm uh, Joe Pickerel. Great. And where does the name Gencove come from? I meant to Ooh, ask. Good question. So we were seek.io, S-E-Q.io. It turns out there's a seek.com, S-E-Q.com. We had a pleasant, uh, you know, play change uh, with them and decided we need to change our name. Right. <laughs> and so we got some prefix prefixes, we got some suffixes, we got a few beers and started iterating. Great. And that's where we ended up. And you fill out that spreadsheet of can we get the website? Can we yeah, trademark so it? Can we get the .com? Is it trademarked? 
Uh, yeah, all, all those things. Check, check, check. Does Great. it sound ridiculous? No. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, perfect. That's good. I, 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 sometimes you speak to people who've got like a whole Greek myth underlying. Yeah, yeah. No, we can probably invent that, right? Like, <laughs> yeah, you know, the, you know, my, my great grandmother was named Gen Genevieve with G. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly. Well, great. Thanks. Uh, thanks so much. I really appreciate it. And um, thanks, everyone, for listening. As always, you can send any of your feedback and questions to podcast at sonogenetics.com. We uh, do read and respond to every email. If you like the podcast, then please feel free to share it with a friend or leave us a review on iTunes to help other people find us. And then finally, feel free to check out our website if you want to learn more about some of the research projects we're working on or read more about some of these topics through the blog. Thanks very much, and we'll see you next time.